Tea and Sanctuary with Emma Newman. Hello, my lovelies. Oh, it's awful out there, isn't it? Let's have a nice cup of tea together and maybe a cheeky biscuit or three and have a little catch up. Well, I'm having a cup of tea. You can have whatever you like, of course, as long as it makes you happy. If it pleases you, feel free to imagine that we found the most delightful nook in a huge library that permits the consumption of beverages as long as only good things are spoken of. Otherwise, it makes the books nervous and nobody wants that. Above us, the ceiling is painted blue with little gold stars in the medieval style and the bookcases are made of old oak. The armchairs are old but comfortable. The air is filled with the sweet scents of ageing paper, vanilla and just a soupçon of hope. So this is the first episode of a new podcast and truth be told, I'm a tiny bit nervous, but that's just silly, isn't it? All I'm going to do is talk to you about the things that have made me happy, things that give me hope, and then a little bit about what I've been up to lately. There's going to be five segments in each episode, and it's unscripted, because it's a chat, it's not an essay, after all. What I want to do is to create a sanctuary, just for a little while, for you and I, so that we can restore ourselves. Part one. A delightful, real-world experience. So last weekend, I went to Hereford for the first time. And this is a small, relatively rural town in England. And in the middle of this town, there is a very impressive cathedral, which is very beautiful. And the thing that I went there for was to see the Mapper Mundi, the Hereford Mapper Mundi specifically, because there are several apparently. And the one in Hereford Cathedral is about 700 years old. And it's one of the biggest ones, if memory serves, of its type. And it's basically a map of the world painted onto vellum and The thing that is really striking about it is that even though it is ostensibly a map of the world, it is not anything like what you and I are used to. And I'm not just talking about the fact that we're all used to the, um, what is it, the the Mercator projection? The, the, The most common one where it's got the UK right in the middle, probably because of dreadful imperialist reasons, and all of the other continents laid out in a very familiar pattern and you know, really quite inaccurate shape. And the thing that really struck me about the Mapper Mundi is that they've drawn a map of the world as they conceive it, but it's different to how I conceive of a map. So if I think of a map of the world, it's a representation, a drawing of what we know to be the geography of a location. And the Mapper Mundi kind of does this but it's also a map of how they conceptualized the world not just geographically but also mythically and religiously this was the first time in three years i think that i went and did something touristy i actually went to a location and went to an exhibit and really enjoyed it There was the pandemic, obviously, the main reason I haven't done that for a long time, but also I had a breakdown and I just had the most appalling three years. And so this feels like it was a real milestone for me to actually go to a different town and go and look at something. The thing that I really loved about the Mapper Mundi wasn't just the fact that it was so weird that it gave insight into a completely different experience of the world that people had all that time ago. It wasn't just the fact that it had east at the top, that Jerusalem was at the centre, that this weird misshapen blob (laughs) in the bottom left-hand corner was the British Isles. What was fascinating was that it had loads of cities, familiar cities, and they were all relativistically in the correct location with regards to each other. But 
on this completely wrong shaped blob. Really, really fascinating. Anyway, it wasn't just that that I found interesting. It was the way that the mythical was mixed in and was just given as much importance as, I don't know, the location of Exeter. <laughs> there were other places like, you know, Jerusalem and the Tower of Babel. Just there, as if it's a city, as if it's an actual physical place. But the best one of those was the fact that it has Eden at the top of the map, walled off because it's obviously really hard for people to be <laughs> in Eden. And it had Ab Adam and Eve just outside it, having just been luzzed out. It's just the weirdest, most delightful thing. And the thing that was really nice was that the exhibition was genuinely worth paying the entrance fee for. And you see several replicas of it as you walk through the exhibition and then right at the end, through another set of double doors in a darkened, much smaller room, you see the actual Mappamundi itself. And so it's strange, you encounter it, I think it's like three different types of um, representation to pick out different details before you actually see the real thing. But by the time you see the real thing, you understand it more. And I, th I think they've done it really well. In addition to the Mappamundi, there's a chained library. That was an odd mixture of wonderful and quite disappointing for me because seeing the chained library with all of the books, the ancient books, and some of them are in display cabinets so you can actually see inside them and there's um, a little mini exhibition about how the books were made and loads of really gorgeous little details. The actual library itself is a relatively new building. It's very beautiful, very beautiful small library building, but it's very modern. I've been to much, 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 much older libraries with very similar books in them. And going to this one in Hereford made me realize that it's the library itself, which is as much of the experience than just, you know, the books themselves, even though they were really cool, you know, six, 700 year old books still chained up to stop them from eating children or something. No, it's just because they're very valuable. They didn't want those pesky scholars running off with them. But I really do recommend if you have the opportunity to go and see the Mappamundi exhibit in Hereford Cathedral. The other thing I really loved going back to the Mappamundi, it had a golden fleece drawn on it and also a unicorn with the biggest unicorn's horn I have ever seen. It was just... <laughs> ridiculous. It was just such a weird thing. Such a weird thing to look at. It really did feel like a little bit of magic connecting us with people from so long ago. It's really hard to articulate. Part two, a delightful creative work. So I've already gushed about this on Twitter a little bit a week or so ago, but I'm doing it here too because I loved it so much and I want people to watch it. It's the Fargo TV series. It's been out for ages, absolutely ages. And in all honesty, for years, I just ignored it because I'm very fond of the film Fargo by the Coen brothers. I just think it is a really, <laughs> really weird, really in places, very powerful piece of cinema. And when I saw that there was a TV series, I thought, oh, they're just taking that story and what, dragging it out into a TV show? Because I didn't bother to look into it at all. It's not that at all. So if you've been laboring under the same incorrect assumption that I did for many years, the Fargo TV series is not just a remake of the film. It's kind of a love letter to the film and it does exist in the same universe as the film and very similar geographical location. But it is its own thing and it's, it's just marvellous. It's some of the best television I've seen in years and there's been so much damn fine television of late. We really are in a golden age of TV and I loved it. The first season is written entirely by Noah Hawley, who was the, the guy who I was going to say founded it. I don't know what the correct term is for television, but yeah, he was the guy that made this project happen. Um, and the Cone brothers are executive producers 
this podcast is not an essay, I am telling myself. <laughs> I had a sudden moment of, oh no, I really should have done more research. No, I'm telling you about something that's wonderful. You can go and watch it, you can go and read about it if you want to. The thing that most excited me about this show was that it's got the best villain I have seen in television. And that used to be Fisk from Daredevil. Daredevil wasn't really doing much for me when I first started to watch it. And I was going to give up on it. And then in episode two, there was that amazing fight in the corridor. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's filmed as if it's one great big long shot. It's just beautifully done. It's so good. And I thought, oh, oh, all right. That was really, really cool. I'm going to keep at this. I'm going to stick with it. And then Fisk came along and I thought the character was so compelling and so well done that I watched the whole of the rest of that series just for Fisk. I don't really care about anybody else. Because what's his face who... Oh, the one who plays Daredevil. Good grief, I'm terrible with names. He's got the most gorgeous lips, but that just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. I needed really compelling psychological explorations of evil. <laughs> and that was, that was what Fisk was doing for me. But then Fargo came along and Fisk has been usurped as my favourite television villain. Potentially favourite villain, actually. Um, and the, the villain in Fargo is called Lorne Malvo. And I think it is the best portrayal of chaotic evil that I've ever seen. It's played by Billy Bob Thornton and his performance is sublime. It's just incredible. I loved the show so much. Really interesting use of music. All of the characters are really well drawn, really interesting, do appalling things. It keeps you guessing. I loved it so much. Maybe one day I will do an, a deep dive into each episode, but oh, blimey, do I have the time? No, no, I do not. But it's great. If you don't mind violence, obviously there's murder in it. There are bad people doing bad things in it. But if you can stomach that sort of thing, it's so worth it. It's so well done. It's wonderful. And even though there are awful things happening in it, there are also really good people in it. And that was really important. Part three, something that gives me hope. So I've been nerding lately about agrivoltaics. It makes me really excited. <laughs> and there's a reason why, which I'm not ready to share yet. And there's another reason why, which is just because I love learning about tech and solutions to the climate crisis. But it's just something I find really, really interesting. I really like learning about people finding solutions. And agrivoltaics are such a simple thing, a simple, such a simple approach that it makes me happy. And all it is basically is a combination of agriculture and solar farm setups. So instead of having land devoted just to solar panels, the approach of agrivoltaics is to set them up in such a way that you can do other agricultural things on that land, but that most importantly, both benefit from each other. I could probably have explained that better if I'd scripted it. Let's see how long this non-scripted approach to this podcast lasts. <laughs> when you have solar panels in long lines across a field, if you just have them at like, waist height or whatever, and you do nothing else with that land, then you're effectively putting that land into competition with other uses that we need to keep people alive, like growing crops or grazing animals or whatever. So some very clever people said, well, hang on a minute, do they have to be in, con in competition with each other? Can they not benefit each other? And they do. And there's some really great research that's being done um, in France, in Germany, in Colorado, Arizona, in the States, a couple of other places in the States. But the world leader in this is Japan. And they already have over a thousand agrivoltaic installations because they have a small land mass. They have high energy needs like most countries do now. And 
So they had to find a solution if they wanted to generate a lot of solar energy that didn't mean that the land couldn't be used for anything else. And the really cool thing about this solution is that it solves, actively solves more than one problem. So the first problem it helps to solve is obviously generating energy from sustainable sources and more importantly, not generating it from the, the burning of fossil fuels. But the other thing that it does is that it helps with water use in agriculture because the shade from the solar panels means that less water evaporates and so you don't need as much water to irrigate the crops that are grown underneath as you would if they were completely exposed to the sun. And because the sun is moving, obviously, across the sky as the day goes on and the panels are shifting, it means that no part of the plant is always in shade. They're just shaded at certain points of the day. And that is actually better for the plants, especially when you've got a really hot and sunny environment or a place which has you know, hot summers, um, because there's own, there's a, obviously plants need the sun to photosynthesize, but it's not like they use every single bit of sunlight that they're exposed to to create all the food. There's a point where they can't benefit anymore from that amount of sunlight. And if it's really, 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 really hot, they can suffer. So having partial shade during the day can be really beneficial to lots of crops. And the microclimate that's created underneath the solar panels means that the solar panels are kept cooler. So one study found that having crops grown beneath the solar panels increased their efficiency by 2%, which doesn't sound like it's very much, but if you imagine that over a 25 year period, that's quite a lot. Um, and you know, all of it helps. And they're still figuring out the best ways to do this, the best heights of the panels, the best crops to use, etc, etc. The other thing as well is that the panels can protect the crops beneath from hail and from severe cloud bursts. We're getting more extreme weather, it can help protect them from that. And one study where they were looking at different crops, there are lots, I'm not going to bore you with all of the, the details of this, but this one study found that um, when you grow cherry tomatoes underneath solar panels, obviously it depends on the region, but in this one particular study, they used 30% less water and doubled the yield. So there was an active benefit to growing the crop underneath the panels. So yeah, that's made me happy. It gives me hope. It makes me happy that there are people who are actively researching this, working out the best ways to do it. There is no single perfect solution to the energy crisis, but there are lots and lots and lots of imperfect solutions that exist now that are getting better and that's great. Part 4. Adventures in surviving late stage capitalism as a writer. What I thought I would do is kind of talk about what I'm working on at the moment, where things are at, to give you an insight into what it's like being a jobbing author. <laughs> If this is the first time you've come across me and you have no idea who I am, I'm actually a writer and I've written an urban fantasy series, five book series called The Split Worlds. And I've written four science fiction novels, standalone but interconnected set in the same universe, starting with Planetfall. And I've had novellas and short stories and lots of other things published. But the last book that came out was in 2019, which was Atlas Alone, which was the fourth novel in the Planetfall universe. And then life fell apart, terrible things happened, then the pandemic happened, terrible things continued. <laughs> and it, it all went to hell. Um, but over the last, ooh, I would say probably this year, I've actually started to be able to work again properly. Um, and over the last two years, I've managed to write some, some short stories. I'm also an audiobook narrator and I've had some audiobook work. So earlier this year, I finished a book that I've been commissioned to write, which I still can't talk about. And for people who've been subscribed to my newsletter and my patrons, I'm really sorry, I still can't talk about this yet, but I've done it. I've written the book, I've handed it in. 
it's in a completely different genre to what I usually write. But I've done it, I've sent it in, that's, that's all I can do for now. And since then I've been working on all sorts of bits and pieces. I've got a Planetfall short story collection which is pretty much ready to publish. I'm waiting for the book cover to be completed. I've seen early stages of it and I need to record the audio version of the collection and it's going to be a collection of 10 short stories that I wrote for my newsletter subscribers over 2019 and 2020 uh, and maybe 2021. I don't remember. Time is meaningless. And there's also a really um, chunky interview where I asked my subscribers and my patrons if they've got any questions uh, about the Planetfall universe and about writing etc. Um, and they've sent them in and I answer them so there's a, an interview included with the collection. So yes that's my next job is to record that and um, when the cover is done to go into the brave new world of uh, self-publishing. I know that there are publishing houses out there that do do short story collections but I kind of just wanted to have a go at doing it myself. When I had a look online it was apparent that it's become so much easier to do it. I'm at the point now where <laughs> there are actually potentially four different books vying for my mental attention and I've got a call with my agent tomorrow to talk this through. One of them is not really any kind of uh, science fiction or fantasy genre, it's, it's real world with a hint of potential maybe is that magic but very very low level, that's not what the book is about. Uh, the second book is a, I guess a thriller would be the closest genre that I could peg it as and I've written about oh I don't know 30,000 words of that and the thing is if I wanted to try to get that published I would have to write the entire book because in the publishing world if you haven't written a book in a particular genre it doesn't matter how many books you've had out before then if you're a mid-lister like I am anyway you need to be able to prove that you can write outside of the previous genres that you've had some success in and so that is a scary gamble because that will be many months of work and it may not sell and this is my main source of income. So I was a bit kind of twitchy about investing many many months into something that may not sell and I've done that before, that happened with Planetfall. I'd never written science fiction before, I wrote the entire book, it took eight months to sell and it was a very fraught eight months because I had put in a huge amount of time into writing the book and I was afraid that it wasn't going to work out and it turns out it was very successful and it was great but I didn't know that at the time. But I've been thinking a lot about how I feel like we need to really start to imagine something better and so I have started to work on a utopian novel. I'm really quite excited about it. I've written the first three chapters which was about 11,000 words. I've written the synopsis, it's with my agent at the moment, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. But then this weekend I had an idea for another book which is what I would call a high concept mainstream speculative fiction book and it just won't let me go. So I'm, I'm basically flailing around about which book I want to write next and that's why I'm speaking to my agent tomorrow because she's going to help me to figure this out. So that's, yeah, that's where things are in the book front. I've got several ideas, they're all vying for attention, don't know what to write next, going to talk to my agent. But the main thing is, the, the, the big relief is that, you know, for, for all of 2020 and 2021, I really did not think I'd ever be able to write a book again. I wrote that commissioned novel but it was really hard. I was worried that that was going to be my last book, that, that there was nothing else in me and thankfully that was just the breakdown talking. Part 5. Delicious Nerdery So I'm a LARPer and LARP stands for Live Action Roleplay 
and there's tabletop roleplay and uh, LARP, and I do both. The tabletop roleplay that is kind of most famous now is D&D, thanks to Critical Role and um, Stranger Things. LARP is where you actually wear the costume and physically act as your character. There are loads and loads and loads of different types of LARP. You can have parlour LARPs, which are just in one room. They can just last for an evening, a very small story, single story, or you could have a parlour LARP that is repeated, you know, regular slot, and a long story that's told. You can have one-off LARPs that run for a weekend in a particular grand location. I've never done those, but they sound really interesting. The reason I haven't done them is because they're often really expensive and it's a huge, huge amount of effort just for one event, which puts me off. The sweet spot that I found is a LARP called Empire, which is run here in the UK. So four times a year, for three days, a city is created on a farm. It's really hard to describe the scale of this. It's all canvas apart from a couple of wooden structures in the centre, it's completely temporary. Um, and it's mostly bell tents and completely non-modern tents in the in-character area. And they create a city called Anvil, which is also a temporary city within the game world. When I started playing it, I think there were just under 2,000 players. And it felt pretty huge then. And I've been playing it for five or six years, I can't remember, because time is meaningless. And now, I think at the last event, which was, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, uh, there were over 3,000 players. I heard someone say 3,300. I don't know what the actual number was, but it's incredible. It's, it's really exploded this year. And it's basically a fantasy world. There are 10 different nations which have their own aesthetic, their own cultures, their own hearth magic. And it's great. When I do LARP, it's a really high effort thing to do. There's camping, there's costume, there's makeup. There's the physical challenge of acting, effectively, portraying a character. It's not an easy hobby, but it is so damn rewarding. It's not perfect because nothing is perfect, especially in gaming, but you find the right people who want to tell the same kinds of stories as you, who enjoy the same kind of role playing as you, it is the most magical experience. And the reason why I love LARP so much, I think, is kind of because it's so challenging, because it really encourages me to develop skills. So for example, in the last event, I had to make a pretty controversial argument um, it's a religious-based argument, it's a completely made-up religion, it's very different to what I would conceptualise as religion. There's no spiritual, like, God's aspect or anything like that. It's, it's very interesting. But I had to effectively make a religious case for something, which I guess the closest approximation to real-world stuff would be a philosophical argument with a group of people who are very invested in their own viewpoints in this philosophical system. And that, that is not my strong point. And it was scary and challenging. And I, I was really nervous before the event because it's something that is very important to my character and I didn't want to screw it up. I didn't want to screw it up because of a lack of hard skills in the real world. <laughs> but it was also that it really is important to my character for this to be successful. And it was, and it was, yeah, it was great. It was just the right kind of challenging. It gets me out of my comfort zone, I guess, is part of what I'm saying here. But there's also, there are so many different aspects to it. I love the crafting side of it because I made all of my costume and it's making costume that has to withstand apocalyptic levels of mud sometimes because the first event of the year is always in April. And sometimes the field is a bog and it has to be able to cope with heat waves and when you're designing clothes which are based off the medieval europe style early medieval you have to really think these things through and 
there's a practical consideration to dressmaking, which I haven't had to worry about as much for all of the other dressmaking I've ever done. So I love that side of it as well. And designing costume to reflect your character's progression and journey over the years. I, I love it so much. It's the end of the mainline uh, events for the year. There are four events. And I've just got one more booked this year, which is um, what, what is called a player event, which is organised by players, much, much, much smaller. And it's just for an afternoon and evening, which I'm really looking forward to. And I'm probably going to make a new frock for. If you're listening and, and you haven't done any kind of role playing whatsoever, it, I guess that the easiest way to explain it is that it's like improvisational drama, but it's structured by a world that's created by the game runners. Uh, so you, you don't have a script. You have a character that you play that is not you. And you can make that as complex and psychologically deep as you want. If you've read my work, you may be unsurprised to learn that my character is massively psychologically complex <laughs> and deeply traumatised. And it's it's an exploration of recovery from extreme trauma, um, which I've been playing out for, for many, many years. And it's incredibly satisfying. Someone called it, what was it? Cross-country pantomime? <laughs> I don't know. It, someone came up with this years ago and it's just been going around in LARP circles. I think that's what it was. Yeah, cross-country pantomime cross-country improvisational theatre just because there's the physical endurance aspect and also there are huge battles that take place people have you know latex weapons and go and wallop each other uh one battle on the saturday one battle on the sunday i don't get involved with that side of the game though in smaller player events i have fought um and in fact a few years ago it helped me to motivate myself to get super fit because there was a big player event that was effectively written for my character in which my character could die very easily it was a high risk event and uh, I got super fit and I'm really glad I did because on the last day of that event we were fighting pretty much constantly for four hours and it was intense it's a wonderful thing I love it I'm gonna make a new frock for this next player event it's a great hobby it's a weird hobby but I thoroughly recommend it so I think that's everything I'm going to talk about for today. I've no idea if the format is going to stay the same. All I can hope for is that it's taken you away from the world just for a little while and that it's helped to restore you. So is there anything that you've read, watched lately that you've loved that you'd like to tell me about? Is there somewhere you've been that's been really interesting like the Mapamundi exhibit? Please tell me about it. You can get in touch with me through Twitter. I'm M Apocalyptic, E M Apocalyptic on Twitter. Um, you can go to my website at www.enewman.co.uk. There's a contact form. You can drop me an email if you like to tell me about something wonderful, something that has delighted your senses. Tell me about something that's given you hope. Is there a cool community project near you that has been doing awesome things? Is there some other bit of clean energy production technology that you're really excited about? Has there been a breakthrough in some field of research that makes your toes curl with joy? Tell me about it, please. I want to know. I'm coming back into the world after three unbearably difficult years. And even though things are terrible, there is still so much out there that is wonderful. There are still so many things being created that can uplift us, that can inspire us. There are so many good people doing amazing things. Tell me about it. And then I can share it with everyone over a nice cup of tea. Take care, my cherry blossoms. Lots of love. Bye. You've just listened to an episode of Tea and Sanctuary. If you enjoyed the show and would like to be an absolute bless poppet, you can help to keep the teapot full by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Emma Newman. This episode was brought to you by the last three malted milk biscuits in the packet, five cups of tea, and one offering to the fairy that lives under the flower pot at the bottom of my garden. Go forth and be lovely to each other. <laughs>